Awesome. Welcome back to another episode of Vancouver Real. My name is Mike Zaramba, and next to me is my big brother, Andy. Hey, everybody. Good to be back. What episode is this? Anyways, 20, 24. 24. So we're, we're, almost, up. we're almost at the quarter century mark, which is good. Yeah. Uh, happy holidays to everybody. Um, and we wish everyone a, an awesome 2015 coming up. And uh, I wanted to take a, a little minute or a second to just recognize the Coast Salish land that we're on, the unceded land of, uh, of the, where Vancouver as a city is situated, has uh, been now um, legally pronounced unceded land, which is going to be a very interesting future, I think, for the collaboration between the uh, indigenous population here and the city uh, representatives. Um, and uh, I'm going to dig in more into that information, but I wanted to just do an initial recognition that uh, Sobe Wing introduced us to, who is on podcast number 17 or 18, I think. Uh, he kind of brought that up, and I think it's important to continue that on. So we'll, we'll kind of recognize that for each podcast, and I'll get more information to be a little bit more uh, technical with it and have a better understanding of what actually that even means. So, um, so as always, we're podcasting here out of Float House in downtown Vancouver, BC, in Gastown. We're at 70 West Cordova Street, and our website is floathouse.ca. Um, if you yeah. enter the um, promo code, what's the prep one for today? Probably the promo code cannabis. Yes. Probably appropriate. Uh, if you enter the promo code cannabis, you can receive a 20% discount off a single float. Yes. So uh, take advantage of that, people. And um, I'll also plug Omega Point YouTube channel, which is Omid, who is our missing partner today, who's not here, but uh, he still helps us with the editing post production wise and uh, just get everything all pasted together. So it's O-M-E-G-A point. Uh, it's a really cool YouTube channel where Owen puts some really thought-provoking videos on there. And uh, so go check it out if you get the chance and subscribe to his channel. And, and finally, I just want to, we've never really thanked the people who regularly listen to Vancouver Real and support us and subscribe to the channel and listen on iTunes and share it. Um, you know, we're, we're in a young stage of it, but uh, the people that are giving us the positive feedback um, and the encouragement to keep going with it, we really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to, you know, we, we love doing it, so we're going to keep doing it. And it's something that, um, you know, we'll let it take its own course. But uh, thank you so much yes, for your support. Thank you. Yeah. It's been awesome so far. Cool. Now let's move on. On to bigger and better things, because today's guest is someone that I met personally, uh, Oh, maybe a month, two months ago, three months ago at the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference at UBC. And um, he's an author, a cannabis historian, um, and I'm sure there's much more to it than that. But today we have Chris Bennett with us. And I'm just going to show his book right away. Uh, this is his third book that he's written. It's called Cannabis and the Soma Solution. So this is something that's been around the internet, the, the Soma mystery, really, for a long time. And... Uh, you know, Chris has written a whole book on the solution of it. So we're going to dig into that um, today. And, and I mean, I heard him talk at the plant medicine conference and uh, it, uh, it really was a fascinating talk. And I felt like you could have gone on forever. But um, anyways, long winded introduction. Chris, thanks for coming on. Hey, it was a pleasure. And uh, it's cool to see what you guys are doing down here. Thank Good you. Good stuff. Yeah. Cool. Um, and I'll also say his book is available on Amazon. So go and check that out uh, if you uh, if you choose. Um, and Chris, so welcome. And uh, we wanted to uh, also introduce you. You are actually a neighbor, really, down mm -hmm. at the um, the Urban Shaman, which is on Hastings. What's the address of the Urban 307 Shaman? 307 West Hastings. I share a uh, spot with Mark Henry's Cannabis Culture Bookstore. Right. We've been, been there for Mark, about 12 uh, years, yeah. We met Mark for the first time on, uh, what was it, Saturday? Yes, yeah, it was we went pretty in. fun. Nice, nice. Now he's yeah. pretty happy these days, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's cool to have him back, right? Yeah, yeah. It's when you have that kind of freedom back in your life, you got to be happy. Yeah, right? absolutely. You know, it's just like his attitude was like he stepped out a, a door in time about four and a half years ago and yeah. then stepped right back in. And he was just right back into it. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, we invited him in for a float and we're like, yeah, you know, you got to get in there and isolate yourself. He's like, you've been in prison for four years. <laughs> you've been isolated enough. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, fair enough. You yeah. got me yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sure. He did little. some serious uh, solitary time when he was in there for yeah. sure a couple times. Yeah, oh, it's crazy. It, I mean, that, that's a whole other story. And, you know, we, love to get him on because yeah, it's I'm such sure a messed to. up story. But. Yeah, yeah, get his side of it and just maybe moving forward with it too. I'm sure it's been highly uh, 
talked about for him, but um, you know, it'd be nice to move forward with his future goals and projections. Absolutely. And so you, uh, the Urban Shaman Shop, which yep. is inside the store as well. That's and right, yeah. And we specialize in plants used in shamanism as well as natural relaxants and uh, energetic plants. So we have stuff like salvia divinorium, peyote, live and dried, uh, plants used in the making of ayahuasca, things like kratom leaf and uh, blue lotus. And, I'm intrigued and, uh, to try the, the, uh, the kratom, actually. Kratom is the most popular thing we sell, you know, yeah. and it's a really fascinating plant. It's got a lot of medicinal qualities people are only just rediscovering. Hmm. In small amounts, it's a stimulant. In a larger amount, it's more opiate-like, and it's being used a lot in uh, the treatment of opiate addiction, particularly people trying to wean off things like ox Oxycontin, which there's been a, a huge epidemic of addiction on. But in places like Thailand, people also use it to uh, get off of methamphetamine. So wow. uh, um, it's been used uh, also for both ends of the spectrum on addiction stimulants and opiate-like substances. It's, it's legal in this country, right? It's legal, yeah. yeah. Uh, currently, there hasn't been a lot of attention on it. It was mm -hmm. getting some negative attention uh, down south, you know, in some states. Mm -hmm. But uh, the benefits of it for people uh, trying to treat pain and also uh, kick some of these harder addictions seem to be uh, um, outweighing the negative press these days and cool. uh, um, you know, the world seems to be opening up to Kratom. Yeah, that's kind of the case for a lot of these substances that you are aware of and knowledgeable about. Like, you know, it's, you don't hear, there's, there's no legitimate negative um, research coming out about, you know, entheogens and, and cannabis and and uh, all, the, all the other herb allies that there that exist, you know, there's, um, it's just an overwhelming r waterfall of like potential applications. Absolutely. You know, though, the research going on again, you know, and things like psychotherapy with MDMA, there's going to be yeah. the ecstasy, P P uh, TSD uh, study mm -hmm. here in Vancouver. I believe and, that's uh, going on now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Maps. so. And uh, LSD psychotherapy in the U.S. for the first time in decades. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of uh, a lot of interest in these substances yeah. and a lot of positive press, although they are still, in fact, quite illegal and people are still going to jail for yeah. uh, the production, distribution, and even use, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, the prohibition of cannabis is probably one of the most hypocritical uh, laws of our time one of them anyway yeah well you know I, I think any law against any plant you know it's one thing to make chemicals illegal that are man created but you know when you're talking about plants this is like a natural uh, state of things a natural world and when you're talking about a plant like cannabis you're talking about a plant where we've been using it for tens of thousands of years according to the latest uh, research archaeological evidence for hemp uh, fibers and uh, tools used in the uh, degradation of hemp yeah. breaking yeah, yeah. the fibers off go back 25 30,000 years Years, wow. uh, um, now from late, the latest finds, so this puts it way, way back in human history. Yeah, I really enjoyed the documentary, um, The Culture High, that mm -hmm. scores you one. I just watched that for the first time, and it kind of does highlight so many things that are just wrong with the whole system. You know, the fact that cannabis is still illegal when alcohol and tobacco are out there killing way more people than cannabis ever has every yeah, single yeah. year, and it's still you know yeah under prohibition yeah well yeah. you know it's debatable whether cannabis is, itself has killed a single person you know people have died yeah. well under its effects you know and accidents and things like that but as far as but in terms of uh, overdosing and overconsumption yeah. there's yeah. you know no, no real evidence yeah. that that's even taken place and yeah. uh, you know this is something we would know about the plant in the thousands and thousands of years of recorded use they say that we we need to uh, do more studies all the time on this thing but the, the fact is, is the studies don't happen because the government uh, doesn't allow it to happen, but also this is a plant that has been studied for millennia, yeah. and we have a, a long history of cultural use, so we know a lot about. Yeah, well, yeah, the history for sure around it, for sure. Yeah, and that's what I'm interested about getting into uh, about your book, actually. And yeah, uh, soma has been something you know I kind of came on my radar from listening to the Joe Rogan Experience yeah. podcast, and he started mentioning soma, and uh, what he was always, I think Graham Hancock would speak about it as well. And uh, they never really uh, pinpointed what it was. Well, there's this debate about the subject, right? Uh, um, Soma is this aged Vedic uh, plant and uh, drink and god uh, um, that was uh, referred to in the, the Vedic writings, which led to the Indian religions. And it was also referred to under the name Haoma in the Persian writings mm. uh, uh, of the Avesta. And uh, that's because the, the Persian religion and the Indian uh, Vedic religion come from an earlier identical source uh, via their Indo-European roots. And mm -hmm. so uh, um, this came, came into India. 
And uh, in uh, there's been a lo lot of debate about the identity of Soma, the most popular in modern times being the idea that it was the fly agaric mushroom. And this was from the mycologist and banker R. Gordon Wasson, who wrote a right. book about Soma, uh, perpetuating that it was a fly agaric mushroom. Uh, in my own book, I, I, and, uh, I also cite a number of authors, uh, um, find a number of flaws in uh, um, Wasson's research. And I think he was, to some extent, willfully ignorant. You know, like, for one thing, he didn't discuss the, uh, the Avesta texts uh, regarding Helma. And they're quite clear on their uh, descriptions of Soma as a plant, green plant, bushy plant, you know. Um, and, and then in the Vedic uh, texts in uh, the 10th and 9th Mandala, where the actual uh, physical descriptions are given of the Soma, he left those texts out saying that they were much later than the other versions uh, um, and therefore didn't identify the original substance. And another thing is, is they again identify a plant with branches and leaves and uh, uh, green and purple in color. Uh, um, uh, um, so it's right there. Um, in my own book, you know, also there's been some archaeological discoveries that have taken place uh, since the time uh, Wasson wrote his book. Right. And these are important archaeological discoveries in, the, in, the, in understanding the history of Heoma and Soma. Um, and uh, one of these was uh, they found evidence of this Caucasian culture in China that was living in central China from about 4,000, uh, I mean, uh, 2,000 BC to about three or 400 BC. And this is the Gushi culture. And uh, this was an Indo-European Caucasian culture that was living amongst the Han Chinese uh, and was quite well established there. And uh, they had fine mummified remains of these individuals. Mm -hmm. And one of the mummies had 2,700-year-old uh, cannabis with them. And oh, wow. uh, um, another mummy had 2,800-year-old cannabis. And this was not like hemp fibers and stuff like that. We're talking about well-preserved female cannabis buds that had been uh, um, cultivated for its narcotic content, uh, wow. whether to be used for spiritual or medicinal purposes, is or both, you know, uh, um, is is uh, up to interpretation of the evidence. Um, and uh, the Chinese name from cannabis, hu ma, uh, is very similar to this uh, Indo-European uh, term that was used in Persia, heoma. And uh, they have recently found also the, the, this uh, archaeologist, Victor Serianati, a Russian archaeologist uh, in the outer regions of the Afghan desert uh, uh, in one of the homelands of the, uh, the Zoroastrian religion and the proto-Zoroastrian religion from which arose the Mazdian religion. Uh, they found a, uh, three different temple sites uh, with these huge temple structures. And at two of these sites, uh, which were about the size of a football field, half wow. the temple was dedicated to the preparation of a sacred beverage and the archaeological evidence of sediments in the uh, um, bowls used for grinding the substance as well as in sediments in pots and stuff like that and fossilized uh, impressions of seed show that this preparation was a, a preparation of uh, cannabis and ephedra and then in some later cases poppy. Um, mm -hmm. So it's quite clear and then we also know uh, from archaeological finds at this site as well as the Chinese site that these cultures were involved in a trade of goods uh, and part of a wider network of trade routes. In fact, uh, this uh, um, archaeological find in China particularly has expanded heavily on what we know about uh, uh, the trade in the ancient world. It was thought that things like the uh, Spice Road didn't begin until about a few hundred BC, but now this has changed it to about 2000 BC. Yeah. And uh, um, artifacts from the region have shown that they were in contact with Western Europe, Eastern Europe, all through the Middle East. There were uh, 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 shells from India at the Chinese site. So uh, we're talking about a vast, vast, extensive network. And the mummies themselves, uh, DNA from the mummy showed a, uh, a multicultural lineage of European and Middle Eastern and uh, Asian uh, 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 mishmash of people. So mm. this was a nomadic culture that was interwound in trade routes and uh, uh, um, uh, um, um, bringing b things back and forth like cannabis to these different regions. So the idea would be that this uh, Chinese name got adopted by these people as Huma, went into the Bactria Margiana region, it became Heoma, and then as it traded into China, the link Linguistic changes led to it being called so, uh, Soma.
Hmm. Okay. And uh, um, this is, uh, you know, kind of like a, a shortened version of it, but there's a lot more to it than that. And uh, details on how SOMO is prepared by being ground and mixed with water or milk are identical to the way that cannabis is prepared in India to this day in the drink bong, for instance, which is the popular drink of the Indian god Shiva. Yeah. Who's, who's kind was, of well, what's that called again? The drink? Uh, bong. B H A N G. Bong. Okay. And uh, it's, you can buy that all over India in uh, shops and things like that. And it's drank at festivals like uh, the Holy Festival, the Festival of Colors, or uh, Shivaratri, or the Kumbha Melas, and is a popular, popular drink in India to this day. So is, is the active ingredient in that, is it THC? Or? Yeah, it's, okay. it's THC. Yeah. Okay. And uh, is it actually, is it legal there? It's uh, legal in some states in, in India, and then in other places, it's less tolerated generally on the <laughs> festivals it's always tolerated right holy men can smoke and do whatever they want like yeah. sadhus and, and stuff like that touched. they won't even be touched yeah. ever yeah. Uh, um, sometimes at some of the you know depends in different places like Nepal sometimes they'll arrest uh, kids and stuff that are smoking up with the sadhus and not arrest the sadhus right interesting uh, um, well. but there's usually a bit of an uproar when anything like that happens you know yeah, because yeah. well, they're, they're the holy man. You know, all the yeah. and all the prohibition too. That's a result of you know influences from the British Raj and uh, United Nations and things like that. You know, a century ago, cannabis was you know widely used and prescribed all throughout India. Uh, um, and in uh, when the British Raj was there, they held a, a great uh, a conference and debate about what they should whether they should outlaw it or tax it or mm -hmm. leave it alone. And for the most part, they initially left it alone uh, because there it was so involved with the religious life in India, it would have been an uproar to uh, prohibit it. Uh, um, and one of the ways that they tried to deal with it because they found particularly that figures like sadhus who use cannabis and then also the Islamic holy men such as the fakirs, uh, the nihangs in the Sikh religion as well, were particularly hard to govern as foreigners. And it was hard for them to just uproot them because that would have been an assault on the religious life. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so they came up with this new idea of uh, uh, designating them as insane. And they <sighs> built all these asylums and started uh, uh, you know, arresting these guys and putting them in the asylums under medical treatment. Uh, um, there's a great book, I think it's uh, Cannabis Colonialism and uh, the British Raj or something like that. I, I forget the name of it, but it uh, goes into the details of the whole thing. And uh, it's a really fascinating Wow. Well, it seems like they've uh, used that tactic before, and then they, yeah. and now they're using, using it, they're again, using it yeah. again in well, the, things like yeah. for madness. For well, example. even the modern association of schizophrenia, you know, yeah. this whole idea mm -hmm. that cannabis and schizophrenia are somehow correlated. Um, but uh, there's no spike in, like with the spike in cannabis uh, uh, use, there's no spike in uh, schizophrenia. But, you know, I do think that uh, things like THC can exasperate schizophrenia. And, you know, it's interesting, uh, um, particularly, you know, like uh, when, you, when you think about the role of cannabis in the agent world in relation to this. And, you know, I should point out that the, the use of cannabis goes far beyond these SOMA references. And there's references to cannabis throughout the agent world, Middle East, Babylon, Assyria, uh, even the biblical uh, texts. Wow. Um, and uh, um, one of the ways that, that cannabis was used uh, uh, was more of kind of like a shamanic context. And, and this is, would be included with the Soma and Hela. Uh, um, and uh, um, in places like Babylon and Assyria, uh, they would burn cannabis as a temple incense uh, um, while people were dressed in elaborate costumes, much like the winged costumes and masks that Native Indians wore here. And then they'd be beating tambourines and playing leers, and they'd get a repetitive kind of tune going on. And um, uh, um, the prophets uh, would be inhaling the smoke and probably taking other entheogens and substances as well. And then they kind of start getting into a vibe with the music. And much like a, a rapper who a beats laid down and sure. he starts to kind of fit in, yeah. this right brain trance would take over and they would start prophesizing in kind of a sing-song voice. Wow. And most of the uh, so uh, religious texts of the ancient world, and I'm including uh, uh, the Vedas and the Gathas yeah. and the Avesta and uh, uh, much of the biblical texts, 
texts like the Psalms and things like that and the Assyrian texts all over the world are written in verse, in fact, you know, and that's because of this kind of induction of the shamanic state with the combination of entheogens and uh, psychoactive plants, you know, and let's face it, even things like rap music wouldn't exist without sure. uh, the, the blunts and the spliffs that uh, uh, facilitated, you know, that state of consciousness. Well, it's definitely not rare for uh, artists to be cannabis users. I mean, that seems to be the norm, you know. Lots of different types of uh, musicians, Rastas, uh, yeah. uh, rock and roll. You know, if you were to try and take all your uh, uh, um, all the cannabis users and uh, the drug users out of the rock and roll records, you'd be left with like you know Barry Manilow and a couple <laughs> other ones. You know, yeah. uh, um, yeah. it, it, that's about it. You know, so always in, in music, and there's been many different musical genres over the years. There's a, a type of Greek jazz from the 20s and 30s called uh, Rembigata, and it's all like from the the, the hash smugglers and stuff like that oh, wow. and so there's been many t different points in history where it's influenced uh, yeah. poetry and art and sure. uh, in the Islamic world particularly there's a whole book uh, hashish versus medieval Muslim society by Franz Rosenthal and it's basically, you know, poems for and against hashish by Sufis and dervishes, you know, like some sects preferred wine over hashish and some preferred hashish over wine and some mixed their wine and hashish together, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they all, all wrote songs and poems about it, you know. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it was primarily used uh, in like religious ceremonies then? So yeah, well, for sure, you know, like, well, I'm sure like it, it also medicinal, but you got to remember uh, medicine in the ancient world was often accompanied by rituals and prayers and uh, yeah. uh, things like that. So totally. it's hard to separate. Well, that's yeah. uh, um, yeah. I would say, you know, like, okay, well, could there, could likely our healing. first medicine, you yeah. know, yeah. like as far as, as medicines because of the, the powerful med medical effects of cannabis and this agent relationship, you know, we put it back as I mentioned, mentioned uh, um, fiber use goes back 30,000 years. It's hard to believe that in that aged period that there would not have been some discovery of the psychoactive effects of the plant, especially considering the nutrition of the uh, cannabis seed, which is one of the richest sources of omega oils yep. and most digestible proteins. You know, it contains things like gamma linoleic acid, which is found in human mother's milk and a couple other rare seed wow. oils, and that's about, about it. Um, so it's a very nutritious food source. So, you know, unbelievably, the hunter-gatherer man would not have discovered it. But from archaeological evidence, and I'm talking like solid archaeological evidence, of cannabis being used for intoxicating purposes. The oldest evidence of that is like 5,500 years old, and that's from the Ukraine region and the discovery of a clay polypod bowl that was used for burning the uh, plant in the, an enclosed cave, and they would trap the smoke and inhale it. Um, so we know from at least then that they were using it, but it's hard to believe that earlier that it would not have been used. We just haven't found the archaeological evidence of it, which is hard with a plant which breaks down uh, um, usually from, you know, over time and stuff like that, unless it's been burnt and carbonized or like the Chinese find is frozen in dry, dry climates, right? Um, people like Dr. Jeffrey Guy of GW Pharmaceuticals, the head of, you know, the biggest uh, pharmaceutical company that's actually producing cannabis medicines in Europe, um, he speculates that cannabis may have actually played a role in the time period known as the Great Leap Forward. And that's like this, uh, where a lot of like uh, cultural kind of evolutionary jumps were made so for what humanity. What time period was that? This was like 30,000, 50,000 BC. Yeah. Okay. And things like the discovery of fire, the wheel, things like huh. that, that were, there were some really big jumps in that short time period. And that really changed uh, uh, you know, us away from simple beasts into a more civilized kind of a thing. And he, he thinks that uh, uh, the the way that cannabis can create some novel thinking areas, it has a lot of receptors Definitely. in areas of higher thinking, yeah. and the way it plays with memory and stuff like that may have facilitated uh, some novel outlooks on old uh, things that we've been doing and, and caused some jumps and leaps of, uh, of thought there, you know what I mean? Whether yeah. that happened or not, it's speculation. But we know from 5,500 years forward that cannabis was being used, and most of that use, I would say, that we have evidence of is all in a ritual kind of context uh, um, forward. And that, that initial use was uh, from a group of uh, Proto-Indo-Europeans, and this is where we get the term kana, which is the source of our modern term uh, cannabis. Uh, um, uh, they were also the first to domesticate the horse, and they believed the domestication of the horse took place through the development of hemp ropes and hmm. hemp fibers. Uh, um, and so that allowed for the capturing of horses and their, the, 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 their testing and stuff like that. 
And uh, um, th then, because of this high mobility now, they became nomadic, and they spread the use of cannabis throughout the ancient world. And that's why, uh, uh, um, in different countries uh, uh, and regions, uh, the terms for cannabis are often related. They come from the same root, cana. And uh, um, we, we know in French, chambre, and it's got that A-N of kamba, and German, hanf, and uh, in Sanskrit, uh, sana or kana, uh, um, and uh, uh, all over this, this uh, uh, in Dutch canvas, all of this is because it came from this one original culture that spread it out and spread Sorry, out. Where language. was that culture? That was uh, originally in Ukraine, Indo-European culture, and spread into the Russian steppes and spread out throughout that region. But coinciding with that, there was also this agent Chinese use, which is just as agent. And so it was already spread, you know, right around that region, five, 6,000 BC was in, in wide use. And uh, in the Chinese, the pharmacopoeia already by, you know, 1700 BC, it's, there's references to cannabis medicine and stuff. You so it's know. the Ukrainians. Uh, um, Ukrainians. <laughs> so no wonder we mesh with this so that's well. Right, that's right. <laughs> well, we have right. Ukrainian background. Yeah, yeah so. Ukrainian background. Yeah. And then, and then <laughs> they, they developed into later Scythian culture and they really spread it around, you know, a couple of millennia later. I want to ask you, do you subscribe or do you have any thoughts on like Graham Hancock's, uh, you know, um, the species with amnesia, the the um, this lost civilization, this chunk of time where we probably had a pretty, uh, pretty advanced uh, global civilization. I mean, not global civilization, but like pockets of like civilized society that has kind of gone missing. Like, does any of your research kind of uh, show you know, signs I, of that? I think that you know, maybe pre-Ice Age or something, that you, I don't know about like advanced in the state that we are. Like, no, you know, no, I wouldn't be advanced. Planes and cars but, and things like that. No, computers. no, no, I don't think that at all. Uh, um, but, but you know, even like in recorded history, it's like, you know, these people like things like herbalism and Assyria and Egypt and places like that, we're, we're only just kind of caught up in the last century or so because of the Dark Ages and the loss of all that type of knowledge. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, so there's definitely, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, for the, dark, the Dark Ages really kind of set us back. There was a lot of stuff going on before that. Um, you know, I don't know. I kind of find some of Graham Hancock's stuff a little far out, you know. Sure. I, uh, um, uh, um, but... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that even just from, you know, like there's that, that, that 12,000 year old find, I think Topol or what, yeah. Go back things, like yeah, yeah, there's, there's, there's always stuff like that. And that's like obviously some pretty skilled building and stuff like that. And that throws a lot of previous knowledge, what we had about uh, the development of, of that type of uh, construction and things like that and those type of abilities. Oh, it's mathematics, uh, yeah, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, it throws calculated. a lot of stuff out, you know yeah. what I mean? But yeah. uh, uh, the idea that, you know, like some of these guys are putting out there, not, I'm not just talking about Graham Hancock, but some of the, you know, other people are uh, some advanced culture and stuff like that. And then they're working with stone and building simple structures like Egypt's, I don't know, you know like pyramids, you know what I mean? Like a pyramid is one of the simplest kind of designs for a, for a, for a tall building that there is. You right. Know? Well, I mean, yeah, and I don't necessarily think it was like a technologically advanced society, but in terms of maybe their sophistication, their culture, their yeah. philosophy, their Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Oh, there's been lots of discovery hitting at stuff like that. The guy found in the Alps, for instance, he had all sorts of stuff that they wouldn't think somebody from that time period right. had and uh, uh, other things like that. So definitely we're still finding out, even with those Chinese mummies, that's changed the whole uh, um, idea about things like how the horse, for instance, uh, 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 first was domesticated in China before they had taken credit. But these guys had horses and they came from an Indo-European culture that were already familiar with a horse. So now mm. did the Chinese culture uh, domesticate their horse on their own or did they pick it up from another culture that brought it, you know. So there's always like, a, you know, things that we're finding out that change uh, uh, the patterns of time and, and our knowledge on history, that's for sure. As a historian, um, I just want to hear your kind of answer to this. Why is it important to understand our history? Like, what what is, why is it important? Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's a like, big question, but uh, um, I think you know, in regards to cannabis, one of the things that it does is it kind of recloaks the plant itself in the sacredness and uh, 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 history of it. You know, mm -hmm. it's like yeah. this incredible thing in the Asian world that was uh, revered and you know what I mean and then it, you know first came back it was almost kind of a joke dope and Cheech and Chong and stuff like sure. that but then as people really started kind of uh, 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 looking into it uh, it's like a pivotal 
relationship. It's almost like uh, interspecies dependency that we've had with this plant. Mm -hmm. And so much of when we strayed away from it, so many of our problems, you know, um, are created from that straying away. You know, like it was a major lighting oil until we started using whales, you know, nearly killed all the whales off. And it was the first source of paper and a major source of paper until we started using our old growth forest down and cut down like, you know, 50% of the, the wood cut here even in Canada goes right to the pulp mill to make paper and yeah. stuff like that. And yeah. one acre of hemp over the same 20 year period can produce as much paper as four acres of trees is a much safer and less toxic way to make paper uh, um, and uh, uh, onward ho you know what I yeah. mean uh, uh, um, uh, and then as a medicine you know even prior to prohibition I, I put together a museum collection of uh, cannabis medicine bottles and other things and you know I just found dozens and dozens and dozens of pre-prohibition cannabis medicine bo uh, bottles for everything from uh, 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 head pains to female problems Problems to coughs and colds to yeah. muscle re re reasons uh, to, to corns and bunions and all sorts of things and we're now just rediscovering that you know what I yeah. mean it was like yeah. a major part of our pharmacopoeia major gotcha. uh, medicine uh, um, even for like probably the most popular cough medicine prior to uh, cannabis prohibition was probably Piso's Cure which uh, had cannabis indica as one of its uh, active ingredients you know um, and uh, um, a lot of the suppression, I would say, is also religious-based, you know. Uh, um, Roman Catholic Church suppressed these Gnostic sects uh, that were using cannabis, as well as pagan groups that were using cannabis and other substances. That's what led to the Dark Ages. And then when it reemerged in uh, the witches' times, with the witches' ointments, with other um, nightshades and other things in it and stuff like that, it was again a real war on that. And then the New World, any time... I would say the roots of drug, modern drug prohibition is Christians versus the devil's weed, you know what I mean? And any time that that Christians culture again. has uh, come into contact with the use of these types of substances, be it in peyote and mushrooms in the New World, uh, uh, or you know things as, as such things in Africa and stuff like that, it's always been considered some sort of devil's work and devil's play. And that's been the truth since uh, you know the, the, the Roman Catholic Church took over in the fourth century. So the question that I would have then is, why? Well, because uh, these substances uh, often uh, um, offer the provider the potential of a you know a gateway to the sacred experience itself, as opposed to uh, 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 having to enter that world through a series of priests and bishops and deacons who may or may not have God's ear, <laughs> um, yeah, well. uh, um, but they have a book and in the tradition and stuff like that. Uh, um, and uh, it's more of like a personal experience rather than um, being told something and uh, um, uh, uh, having the faith to believe in it. It's more about your own personal knowledge and personal experience. So you're saying it kind of decentralizes the power and authority absolutely. of religion. Absolutely. It, it, it absolutely does. And that's always been an issue, even in the uh, you know the the history of Soma and Haoma it had to do with you know, their disappearance had to do with the hierarchy that had formed around them and and that's true of many substances I see many gatekeepers uh, uh, forming around these things saying oh you can only do this peyote this certain way or the mm -hmm. ayahuasca this is a particular ritual um, but even in the, the, the those things that sort of area themselves there's all these different traditions and all these different rituals right. it's not like anybody's holding the uh, 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 the right particular way there's just ways that have worked for some people and they kind of continue doing it. Um, but it's more, I think, for me, in regards to these substances, it's more about uh, the effects of the experience themselves, although I find that uh, learning about their role in history and the influence they've played on human culture a fascinating subject. And, and what do you think it is that the, the effects of soma or cannabis use actually how would that influence somebody in a spiritual or religious type way well that was what i was saying oftentimes it was used in conjunction with music and things like that to facilitate uh, a kind of right brain um uh trance that uh, facilitated a kind of a poetic state of consciousness and the person would uh, um, start rapping out <laughs> right. material right and that was a uh, common of a lot of oracles of the ancient world also much larger doses like for the Zoroastrian religion for instance the references we have to there of cannabis uh, use under the names uh, Bonga and Mong and where are they out of uh, they're out of Persia Persia uh, Afghan region as well Bactria Margiana um, and uh, they were like an empire in the ancient world for yeah. a long time at yeah. their peak right 
Uh, um, and uh, the reference is there, the cannabis, usually a potent extract, probably some sort of hash oil or hashish extract, would be uh, infused in wine and then consumed. And it was so powerful, it would knock a person out for a couple of days. Whoa. And they would be in like a death-like coma where they would appear to the outsiders perfectly still and uh, uh, um, breathing just disappeared down to nothing. And then when they returned from uh, uh, um, the effects of this, uh, they would say, oh, you know, I was up and I tr crossed the, the bridge of life to death and I saw heaven and the, the, the righteous were being rewarded and then I saw the pits of hell and the wicked were being, and all this would be taken down as an actual out-of-body experience. You sure. know what I mean? They yeah. actually believe, much like, say, Aborigines in Australia believe the dream time is a reality. They would believe that the uh, uh, experiences they had under the influence of these substances, which were so vivid and real to them, uh, um, were actual experiences experiences so you know then it's really dose related you know what I mean like yeah. more smaller yeah. dose maybe like the temple incense might throw you into kind of uh, uh, a state introspection. where yeah, introspection yeah. and then you can still yeah. verbalize and share yeah. what you're uh, whereas the other one would knock you you're out complete deep. deep sleep and yeah. uh, this was the way that the hashishin in the Islamic world also use it they would like wow. literally get knocked right out and uh, that's so interesting that's I mean that's why I feel like so many times when you can have like a spiritual type experience in the tank uh, because you're, you're just going inside. Yeah. You know, you're going inward. And yeah. That's really where the answers are, right? That's absolutely. And yeah. I think using cannabis in that way I, I definitely um, makes that experience more potent. For lack well, of you know, like yoga and cannabis, they're both associated with oh, Shiva, the yeah. oldest continually worshipped god on earth. But, and if you go to India today and, you know, walk along the Ganges River, you'll come across many sadhus and holy men uh, um, partaking of the chillum or drinking bong before they uh, begin their asanas and start doing their yogic postures yeah, uh, okay. as part of that. And that's been the way it's always been. You know what I mean? So uh, uh, um, that, that's, that's the tradition. Shiva, you know, gets high before he does <laughs> yoga. Yeah. And, well, you know, the funny thing is with a lot of modern yogis is that's almost been shunned. It's oh, like, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that. I would say neo yoga pant yogis. Yoga pant yogis, yeah. Good call. Um, oh, it's like not the way. No, no. That's all Western influence and stuff like that. But it's always been a part of tradition. No. Every, all, all the time, everywhere, you know what I mean? There's been, sure. always been probably yogis who don't use it as well. Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras uh, even talks about some of the yoga powers being attainable through the use of certain herbs and things like that. And he's likely making a reference to cannabis and stuff that was in use by Shaivites and stuff that predated even his writings, you know? Well, I know personally, like, um, I've had amazing experience having an edible before yoga class. Like, I'm talking... I don't, I mean, you can't even describe it. I do it all the time. I haven't done it for a while, but I, I used to do it all the time. And those were the best classes yeah. I would ever have. Even just on, on a physical level. No, yes. not you worry about the meditational side so much. On a physical level, you get so in tune with your body. You get really in tune with like your, your muscular control. And like I, I yeah. find it becomes a lot more uh, yeah. of a finer and refined experience when I'm actually in class. In fact, we even used to, <laughs> to do it with uh, jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yeah, right. Your game would become tighter. You know, hmm. you, 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 you tighten up everything. You become better. I mean, maybe your, your stamina is not quite as good. You're a little more lethargic and tired, and sometimes you might wander off. But if you're actually in it and really in it, For Zen like sports, it, it can be really good. You know, I, yeah. I think, you know, as a surfer, lots of times sure. uh, the, the main surfers at the break were all puffing before going out for a sure. session. I think if you went around to skateboard poles and uh, oh, snowboarding players, hills and things like that. It. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it can really throw you in the zine. Even Bruce Lee, you know, like to partake of the herb, you know. Know, and uh, I think that under the right conditions, it can really facilitate concentration yes. and uh, help get you in the zone. Of, that's why artists and musicians also, uh, um, you know, that kind of helps put you in the zone, shut everything else out. I think cannabis is really good for doing what you want to do. Maybe not so great for doing stuff that you don't want to do, like yeah. fucking boring taxes and things like that. You know? Exactly. Yeah. If you're if you're into if you're working and trying to. You know, concentrate on something you're not into at all, it will definitely show you that and be like, yeah, this yeah. is maybe not what you want to be doing anyways. So Absolutely. I think that's what its kind of threat is to the uh, industrial complex is that, you know... There you go. Uh, okay. um, yeah, it's like, a, 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 um, I forget the name of that uh, long dead comedian there. Um, uh, um, oh, uh, Carlin? No, another guy. The, the younger guy? The younger guy um, there. 
but he, he had a joke else. about, you know, do I want to go to work today or do I want to stay home and learn how to play the sitar? Mm -hmm. it's kind of, <laughs> after smoking a joint, you know, the decision becomes a little easier to I'll, make. I'll pick the sitar uh, Hicks, day. Yeah, Bill Hicks there. Yeah, Bill Hicks. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So do you think that's partially the reason as to why in modern times? In modern illegal. times, it was outlawed by a lot of racism. You know, for one yes. thing, both yep. in Canada and the United States, that played a major effect. If you're to believe Jack Hare, there was like this whole industrial conspiracy by oil companies and paper companies to outlaw the competition of hemp. Um, I think it had a little more to do with racism and uh, uh, the influx of cannabis and jazz clubs uh, and blacks and whites fraternizing and mixing, which was uh, a real social upheaval at the time. And it's pretty clear from the propaganda that was used against it to get it prohibited that that played a major role both here in the United States via Harry Anslinger and here in Canada uh, via Janie Canuck, aka Emily Murphy, Canada's first female judge who wrote about uh, such substances uh, uh, being a vehicle for the dark brown races to subdue the bright brown races. Wow. So quite clearly yeah. a racist overtone there. Well, um, Mark Haddon from uh, MAPS was actually talking about that as well, and he said a lot of the prohibition uh, origins come from race, from racism. Yeah, actually, absolutely. Including Chinese with opium. Yeah. Um, Here in Vancouver, with, even uh, the Chinese cannabis. opium yeah. Uh, wars. And yeah, exactly. <coughs> That's what he was talking about. So it's almost a tool for the powers that be. Uh, and it's ironic because, you know, England forced uh, uh, China to take opium and stuff from them when they were, you know, exporting and importing. Of course. It was like, uh, um, so it's like, you know, the cause and then the, uh, I don't like it when it comes home. Yeah. It's so interesting. I know. Right? It's crazy. Uh, so cool. How, how long have you been doing this kind of research for? I guess about 25 years, you know, yeah. uh, um, and uh, my first book came out in 95, but I've written some articles and stuff before cool. that. Um, and uh, yeah, so about 25 years. Do you have any uh, future um, works in the mind there? Well, I've got a book half written about cannabis and the occult, and that was something I also wrote about in my first book. You know, people like uh, Aleister Crowley and Gurdjieff and Helena Blavatsky and other figures uh, that are well-known in the occult world that were deeply involved with cannabis as well. Um, going back to alchemists and other groups. Um, but uh, mostly I've been working on videos. I've been producing some videos for the internet. I've got one people might want to check out, Cannabossum, the hidden story of cannabis in the Old Testament, and they can see on YouTube, and <coughs> interviews with other cannabis historians like Dr. Michael Aldridge or Michael Horowitz about the wide history of cannabis. I'm actually quite ignorant, if you can go into a little bit, like the occult. Like, what, what is the occult? Um, well, occult just means hidden. Hidden. I just got a little, something in my throat here. Yeah, right. no problem. <coughs> That's something I've always been very curious to know about. The occult. The occult. Is that what it's called? Or occult. O C C U L T. O C C U L T. Occult. Occult. I don't know. I say yeah. occult. And what, um, what were their practices? Central. What were their? Well, there's not really a central around. practice because the term itself just means hidden. But uh, a lot of stuff that would have been considered occult would have been like. Uh, witchcraft, alchemy, secret societies like the Rosicrucians, even Freemasons, uh, uh, other secret societies like that. There's just a whole slew of them. In regards to cannabis, um, uh, uh, cannabis and alchemy in, in, in the Islamic world was already pretty uh, uh, um, uh, established. Uh, and a number of alchemical uh, writers like Avicenna, uh, Sufis and stuff, they've written about cannabis preparations and things. Um, and then we have uh, people like uh, Rabelais, and that's where we get the term do as thou wilt, that was popularized by Crowley, uh, a French monk and bachelor of medicine who was also a, uh, an alchemist. He wrote about cannabis pretty extensively under the term uh, Pantagruelian in his famous uh, books, uh, Gargantua and Pantagruel, which made a mockery of church and state and had these uh, uh, three chapters on uh, cannabis under the her name Herb Pantagruelian in it, uh, which he gave a botanical description and history of, of the plant in. Uh, um, and uh, then uh, um, even like Shakespeare, for instance, I've interviewed a couple of uh, uh, South African professors, an archaeologist and a, uh, um, a, a museum head, and they had uh, theory that Shakespeare had been a cannabis use user. I've heard that before too, yeah based on some of his sonnets, so they went to the, uh, the trust that was in, involved with Shakespeare's property and got pipes from the time period found on Shakespeare's property and had them tested and found evidence of cannabis in the, in the pipes. Uh, um, and uh, uh, Dante, a number of Dante scholars are speculating that Dante may have partaken uh, of some sort of hashish preparation under mm -hmm. the name of Grains of Paradise. 
Um, and uh, then, you know, figures like uh, Aleister Crowley, the, the, the famous magician there, he wrote a 90 page essay, Psychology of Hashish, uh, um, and uh, uh, wrote about it other places as well. And George Gurdjieff uh, wrote about his best friend being the most knowledgeable uh, person on the effects of hashish. And uh, there's descriptions of some of the things he was doing to the students, which sounds like uh, that they were using hashish. Hmm. And Helena Blavatsky, whose uh, Theosophical Society is still quite popular and who brought a lot of uh, Eastern ideas to the West. Uh, she was also an extensive user of hashish. So it was pretty pretty prevalent in the whole occult and a number of secret societies, Rosicrucian groups. There's people like uh, uh, um, Pascal Beverly Randolph, who was the uh, kind of the chief of the Rosicrucians in the 19th century in the U.S., was also one of the biggest importers of hashish, you know. So uh, uh, there's a long, long history probably uh, that developed after the Crusades and likely via the Templars, who uh, are also thought to have been uh, cannabis consumers. And apparently there's a recipe for cannabis infused wines uh, amongst some of the the the, the, the temple existing like, templar writings and stuff so uh you know pretty pretty early stuff you know and yeah, pretty yeah. fundamental uh you, you know and a lot of that type of tradition kind of brought some life back into the whole uh, spirituality uh, in the West. And before that, it was just strictly in the hands of the church. It wasn't yeah. until some of these more hands-on kind of uh, activities, uh, initiations and rituals and things like that, uh, 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 combined with uh, entheogens, got into the hands of other people. That religion really started to kind of uh, come back to life in the West. Before yeah. that, it was just a dead tradition. And even amongst the spiritualism movement, which really revitalized a lot in the 19th century, uh, uh, um, main figures in that, like Louis Alphonse Cahagne and uh, Pascal Beverly Randolph, were deeply, deeply into cannabis and using mm -hmm. cannabis for sort of astral traveling type of experiences. Wow, amazing. That's so cool. So, like, and for yourself, like, how do you, what's your, like, relationship with it? What do you use it for? How do you well, you know, you know uh, um, partake in the herb? Well, I generally, I, I feel like I don't really, I, I did used to do, you know, some symbolic things like tap my third eye and stuff, but uh, I kind of felt I was just doing that for other people. It's, I always know what, what cannabis is and it's uh, it's great history. And so every time I, I take it, I'm taking this agent mystical herb that's partaken of it. For me, I guess it's more about uh, liberating it and using it to really save the planet. Right now, marijuana is saving the world, in my opinion. You know, right now, every what time somebody, every time somebody starts growing hemp, and uh, instead of growing soil depleting cotton, they're saving the world a little bit. Every time somebody makes some hemp paper, instead of cutting down a forest, they're saving the world a little bit. Every time somebody treats a baby with brain cancer or a child with epilepsy, they're saving the world a little bit. You yeah. know what I mean? And in this time, in this age, I think that cannabis is really the paradigm shift, particularly here in Canada right now in this year. You know, we have this election coming up. We have uh, uh, Justin Trudeau, liberal leader, whose parents both smoke marijuana. Justin Trudeau and his mom <laughs> smoke marijuana. You know, I mean, Pierre Trudeau and his mom and his brother was a real stoner skier, so he knows the, the marijuana lifestyle, you know. And and, uh, um, and then we have Stephen Harper, who really represents oil companies and corporations more than he represents the Canadian public. Yeah. Uh, um, and the promise of pipelines through our dear Burnaby Mountain, you know what I mean? Yeah. I saw uh, you up there, um, yeah. Uh, um, and uh, um, so it's a way of getting away from that. It's an actual solution. You know, it's fine and dandy, you know, to complain and say, what uh, uh, is wrong with the world, but if you don't have solutions, then what's, what's the point? And that's kind of how I got into it, you know? It was like, uh, I actually had a religious experience. Guys, that, guys, sorry, can we just, a little quieter? Sorry guys, sorry, we're just, I mean, I'm at 45 minutes. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, I had a religious experience in the 1990 that led to my activism and my writing of my other books. And there was a few things that brought that together. One of these things was um, the Mount Cashel Orphanage uh, controversy started happening. This was the first instance in Canada where they really started exposing these priests for molesting kids. Uh, some of the kids that had been to this orphanage grew up and said, hey, I was molested. And other people started coming out, yeah, me too. And then there was just this whole flood of it. It was the first right. time. And I was like, what's with this, man? Is there, yeah. I hadn't really been brought up with religion. And I thought, well, look at this. Well, these guys are supposed to be all about God and stuff like that. And they're molesting kids. I was, and I started reading the Bible and I couldn't really get into it. You know, it was like, I was a surfer 
surfer at the time, had a job as a night watchman out in Euclid at a fish plant a few nights a week, you know, and read at night. And I kind of started reading about it. And then um, coinciding with this, a friend of mine taped the first documentary that I'd ever seen on hemp. And nobody even knew the word hemp anymore in Canada. It was like lost from the lexicon. And he told me, oh, you know, you can make all your paper out of hemp and all your cloth and fuel. And I was like, no, you can't. You know, I taught him how to grow weed. And I was like, I know everything there is about marijuana. There's no way this can be true. And then he showed me the documentary and there was this old file footage from World War II and the hemp farms. And I was like, whoa. And at that time, all books on growing marijuana, high times, pipes and bongs were banned in Canada. You get a $250,000 fine for uh, uh, selling and promoting anything pro-cannabis. Amazing. And uh, um, so then I looked in the encyclopedias in the library and sure enough, there was like this stuff about hemp and I was like, whoa, I'm gonna find out more about this. And then um, another event happened coinciding was this was the Gulf War in Iraq, the initial first Gulf War. And one night I was uh, um, sitting, and also coinciding with this was the Clackwalk Sound controversy. And this was when they really started focusing on the environmental impact logging was having here in Canada. I grew up on the West Coast, lived in logging towns, fishing towns, and nobody had ever said anything about over logging or fishing. It was just kind of the way of doing business. And then all of a sudden, environmentalists started showing up and saying, hey, you gotta stop this. This is like killing the planet. And at first it was like, what the hell are you talking about? This is just the way things are around here. Yeah. Yeah. And took a while to see, but you know, sure enough, I started to kind of recognize, you know, that these mountains were clear cut, and some of these areas it clearly wasn't growing back the way it was promised that it would, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, um, so there was this whole thing going on. And then the Gulf War started, and Saddam had fired a Scud missile into Iraq, and because of this, they were comparing him to Nebuchadnezzar, the last king of Babylon. Babylon was actually where Iraq is, and yeah. uh, Nebuchadnezzar overthrew Israel, and he just fired the Scud missile. So one night, I'm in the, at this fish plant, reading a newspaper, smoking a joint about three in the morning in the, in the lunchroom, <laughs> right? And I see this ad for this uh, 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 sermon by Pat Robertson, and it said, Revelations 18, the fall of Babylon, and behind him he had picture tanks and jets. And I was like, what the hell? I'm gonna read the book of Revelation right now and just see what yeah. this stuff's about. And so I started reading it. And at the beginning of the book, John the prophet's given a scroll and he puts it in his mouth and it tastes as sweet as honey. And then he swallows it and it turns bitter in his stomach and he begins to prophesy. And I was like, well, Buddy is obviously eating something. You know, what the heck is that all about? And uh, then there's like you know all these references to uh, uh, clothes of sackcloth and billowing clouds of incense. And I'm like, whoa, this is kind of tripping me out. And I got to the end of the Bible, the last paragraph, and it said on Revelations 22, it said, on either side of the river of life stood the tree of life, bearing 12, 12 manners of fruit, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And when I read that, I had this powerful experience where I felt like light just started funneling into my body and that this was a reference to cannabis and its multiple uses and its uh, medical qualities. And I thought, oh, that must be what these Rastafarian dudes are talking about. I'd heard Bob Marley and stuff like that, but I hadn't really paid too much attention to it. And I was like, yeah, that's right. That's and I totally tripped out and I called my wife up and she thought I was having some sort of breakdown. And then the <laughs> next day I got up and I was like, what happened there? Was there, did something happen? Or was I just tripping and I'd look out and I'd see these clear cut mountains and I'd be like, well, somebody's got to start saying something about hemp for, for paper and fuel and fiber, you know what I mean? Because it uh, solves the problem of jobs and the economy. And so uh, at that time, there wasn't anybody else doing anything here in BC. It was before all this huge scene of cannabis was happening here, right? You know what I mean? There was nobody doing it. And so I started like uh, uh, tracking down hemp cloth in China and paper and importing a bit of stuff. And then I'd go to around uh, colleges and universities and I'd give like a little talk on hemp and hand around a little bit of hemp paper and <laughs> hemp cloth no and, and then started making hemp foods and selling them and, and, and just kind of uh, uh, um, got into it because of the industrial impact. I'd already been smoking it for years, but I never really worried about it being illegal. It didn't really directly impact me. So what I was trying to get at there was like this incredible potential of this planet to heal us on so many levels from the, the physical world we live in to our bodies and you know like as a religious sacrament like we're talking about a religious sacrament that has been used in some of the oldest existing world's religions Taoism agent Chinese Taoism there's many references to cannabis for for its use to contact the spiritual world there's like a Chinese core crane from around the fourth century BC first a yin then a yang no one knows what I do jade puds a holy hemp for the one that lives apart in Buddhism you know there's there's stories 
stories of how Buddha subsisted on a hemp seed a day for years uh, while well, he sat in meditation before discovering his divine truths. And uh, so it wasn't later, a rice a day, huh? Yeah, there's a, a grain of hemp a day. Yeah, it's like in the like this is like four centuries in my book. There, the, the, cool. I, I cite the actual religious text. Some say a, a grain of rice and a hemp seed. Ah. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, but I think the more popular version became over time the grain of rice because of the association sure. uh, of cannabis with more shamanic practices. But those shamanic practices returned in Buddhism and later Tibetan Buddhism and in texts like the Mahakala and the Tara Tantra uh, uh, um, uh, texts, there's definitely recipes for cannabis for, for meditative purposes and stuff like that. Uh, in the Hindu religion, it's, its connection with Shiva is, is paramount and uh, in festivals like Holi and uh, Jagannath and uh, Shivaratri and then also its history as Soma, uh, um, or, which is debatable, not as established as the later ones. Uh, in, uh, um, uh, in, 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 in the Judaic religion, it was known as cannabosim, a Hebrew term cannabosim, that more and more scholars are recognizing as a reference to cannabis. And this is uh, a, a term that appears in uh, Exodus 30:23 after uh, Moses, who initially mates God, God and flames of fire from within a burning bush. He's commanded to make this holy anointing wall with about nine pounds of cannabis mixed with myrrh and cinnamon. And every time he's to speak to the Lord, he's to go into what is called the tent of the meeting. And he uh, uh, covers his body in, in this ointment, which has uh, uh, got THC in it. And THC is fatty soluble. It can actually pass through your skin. And then he places some of this oil on the altar of incense. And he speaks to the Lord on the pillar of smoke over the altar of incense in this enclosed temple, right? You know what I mean? And so when you throw cannabis into that scenario, uh, it becomes like an act of shamanism. And like shamans in South mm -hmm. Africa, yeah. South America, and Africa, he's in, taking a psychoactive plant. And uh, um, in the 1930s, uh, etymologist and anthropologist Sula Bennett showed that this term was not calamus, as it's translated in many modern Bibles, but was actually a reference to cannabis that was mistranslated when the Hebrew was translated into the Greek. And she shows this by tracing the modern term back through history, but also comparing it with Assyrian terms for, for cannabis, such as cannabu. And in Assyria and Babylonia, it was used in exactly the same way as a temple incense, but also as a topical ointment that was used to open one's ear to God. So uh, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, this was a reference to cannabis cannabis in ancient Judaism, in the Islamic religions, Sufis and Fakirs and Dervishes have been using cannabis since, you know, probably the 19th, 9th century uh, uh, or possibly even earlier, you know what I mean? And it's yeah. been written about extensively. So, you know, these are all like major still practice religions that have this incredible tradition. So on a spiritual level, it offers this incredible paradigm shift back to these uh, shamanic type of plants from which it originated. Uh, um, and so in all these different levels, med medicine, you know, look at what's happened in cannabis medicine now. The understandings of the endocannabinoid system in the human body is, is like a, the biggest revolution in medicine of this century. Uh, um, and uh, how it affects everything. You're calling some diseases endocannabinoid deficiencies. There's, your body's wow. not producing enough of the natural endocannabinoids. And so you're getting things like Crohn's disease and arthritis and stuff like that. And so what you need is an influx. Of, uh, of cannabis. And there's even some pretty solid, full-on claims of people curing cancer and stuff like that with cannabis these days. And that goes back to uh, the cannabis somehow stopping the blood flow into tumors, uh, causing cell death in the tumors themselves while you know, uh, um, revitalizing the living tissue. Man. So there's just, it's just so many different areas that it affects uh, uh, us that I really think that it's a paradigm shift here. And Canada is right in the cresting wave of that paradigm shift yeah. and it could go either way you know yeah so with Trudeau Justin Trudeau is running for prime minister in 2016 2015 uh, 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 oh it's this year we yeah have it's an this year next year it's, it's the American right. one Wow. Okay. So gotcha. October so far, unless Harper calls for an early election, which he's been known to do, and Harper himself is seeing a rise in the polls uh, due to this ISIL type of uh, mania that's that's cruising around. You know what I mean? It's a couple crazy. more terrorist attacks, and uh, <laughs> that'll kind of really set set him up there pretty good. So, and, and Trudeau has been kind of been on record saying that he would legalize. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. He says he's not for decriminalization. He's for legalization. Wow. Wow. Well, I know what I'm voting for. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for, you sure. Know, for sure, you know. Uh, um, but, you know, it's a tough win. It's like it's he's up in the polls right now, but election's a long ways off, and uh, these conservatives have an unmovable base, you know? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pot's been a really big issue for Harper, uh, always, politically. Uh, even before he, he was an elected official, he was very anti-marijuana. And uh, it's a religious one for him as well. His right. uh, particular church that he's involved in is known for their uh, anti-marijuana stance, even anti-medical marijuana stance. Whoa. So uh, uh, he's, he's from one of these evangelical churches that's pretty, pretty right wing. Man, it's so, it's so crazy that like, you can't open up, you know, like imagine you had a conversation with him, you and Stephen Harper. Yeah. And you're talking about, you know, very clearly, concisely, the, the historical impacts, the medicinal impacts. And, and you know, he would just, I mean, I don't know how. I don't think react, anybody but. could ever have a conversation like that with Stephen Harper. You know, he doesn't even allow the press to ask questions that they haven't already been vetted. So uh, um, really? it's pretty hard. Yeah, it's all. He doesn't, he doesn't even talk to a lot of the press now. It's true. Uh, um, uh, so. It's pretty hard for anybody to to you know reason with him about anything like that, and yeah. uh, he's surrounded by yes men, you know. That's nerve wracking. It's really nerve wracking that the leader of our country. Yeah. Uh, I'm putting that in quotations. Leader of our country, because you know I, I kind of go by the Terrence McKenna quote: "We are led by the least among us." Mm-hmm. Um, we can't even ask them questions. Yeah, no, it's a pretty shut down government. Well, it's funny they had this anti-marijuana campaign going on right now, which yeah. is kind of like their anti-marijuana, uh, uh, anti-Trudeau campaign. Yeah. This way of using their tax dollars to sure. kind of attack Trudeau in a, in a campaign. But uh, they posted their uh, anti-marijuana video on YouTube, and they've just been taking a beating on it. You know, That's like it's like n- a nine out of ten comments are like how terrible the conservatives are and how good marijuana is, and it had like you know probably. 10 times the amount of likes, uh, 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 dislikes as likes, you know what I yeah. mean? So uh, um, they're taking a bit of a beating on it socially, but uh, yeah. They What's the price? video called? Uh, I forget what the name of it is, but yeah. Yeah, just, yeah I've seen it. I think it. we got to post that one up. It's getting yeah. crushed. It's, it's awesome. It's, it's getting crushed. Yeah, they've even had yeah. some new stories. I'm surprised they left it up, to be honest. Yeah, with yeah, yeah. It looks for sure. brutal. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, they always have their people, you know, the conservatives even have, you know, internet trolls on, on their payroll that go around correcting people. Uh, um, on our tax dollars, you know, it's like, jeez. Yeah, so it's, it's. I mean, that's that's why I personally don't choose to uh, really participate in, in in filling my time with learning more about it because. It just it, it infuriates me, you know. Well, it is infuriating, but I think you know everybody's obligated in a, in a sure. democracy to kind of yeah. play a role and you know be at least aware and have some idea of who you're going to vote for yeah. and stuff because uh, these guys got in last time from people not voting as much as they did with vote. Mm-hmm. They got a majority government with 24% yeah. of the vote. You know, no, I'll <laughs> vote. I'll definitely vote. I know I'm just not going to vote for Harper. Guys. Yeah, anybody that could beat him at this point would be be great. You yeah, know? yeah, it's crazy, man. Um, would you want to wrap it up for this week? I guess so. I guess yeah. so. I, I mean, we can, keep, we can keep going. I this know. is one yeah, of those absolutely. ones that can go on for hours and it. hours. Easy. Cool. But, well, uh, but you're right on the corner from us. So. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So that's Urban Shaman. Go visit Chris down at the Urban Shaman whenever you get a chance. Um, he's got a website too. It's called ForbiddenFruitPublishing.com. <laughs> that's right. And if you search Chris Bennett and marijuana or cannabis on YouTube, I've got tons of videos and awesome. uh, interviews and other things on there. People cool. can check out. Chris Bennett on Facebook. You know, go and uh, follow him or connect with him that way. And also Amazon for his book. Um, Cannabis in the Soma Solution. Let me get that on the camera yeah, there, buddy. There, boom. There we go. No, flip it no, over. Look at that cover. You got to flip it over. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm flipping. Yeah, by there local artist Bob I love that cover. I, I would buy that book simply because of that <laughs> there you go. artwork. Oh, seriously? Yeah. I, who did the artwork? Uh, Bob High, he's local artist. Very cool. That's a lot of stuff so, yeah, around There's a lot going on in that in that picture there. It's so, kind of uh, Christmassy, actually. It yeah, does, it's kind of a yeah. glistening <laughs> Christmas tree if kind you, of effect to it. If you want to, you know, get someone a belated Christmas gift, uh, Go for it. I think it'd be very appropriate. It'd look Definitely. very nice in the stocking for sure. Cool. Right. Well, Chris, thanks a lot for coming thanks on. Thanks for man. having me. That was a lot of fun. It Cheers. was fun. And, so uh, come down again, for a float sometime. Yeah, we're Dude, at a float house. Make it happen. Promo code CANNABIS, 20% discount off a single float. Nice. Come check it out. Yeah. Uh, other than that, we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Cheers. To whatever is. To whatever is. To whatever is. All right. Thank you.